I'm going to talk about the history in this lovely book, but I'd like to talk first about the book. It's a real picaresque novel. Um, it pits, just like Ulysses, our hero Jonah, against the vicissitudes of life, but it also pits Angel very much against the vicissitudes of life. And I think of Robert writing this as a double helix. They go apart, they come back again, they go apart, they come back again. Sometimes you say, how is she going to do this? Or how is it going to work? But it works beautifully. Um, it's one trouble after another, but it is Ulysses getting himself home. And that would be Jonah. Um, and Angel is a character who so reminded me of Molly Bloom. Um, so I just see a lot of different things in this novel that are, are really fun to encounter. Um, they echo things in, in literature. And, um, and it's a novel about everyday life and what was going on. So what I'd like to do, what I'm supposed to do, I think, is talk about the history. Um, the history of this novel is quite wonderful. It's about being enslaved. And Robert talks about enslavement and what it meant to the personality of people. He talks very realistically about how African Americans who were slaves were able to create a world within slavery for themselves, such as going to the Jubilee. Um, there were ways in which they managed a life within slavery, which was terrible. I'm not trying to say slavery was at all good. But within that, they were able to manage um, some ways in which to maintain their own personalities, their own culture, and their own needs. Angel is all about exploitation, but it's also very cleverly about how she exploits the system of exploitation in which she finds herself. It's about seeking freedom, wanting freedom, being on the road. It's about luck and danger, the bravery of escape, the foolishness of trying to escape, and then keeping going, not knowing where you are, making hard decisions, having to learn how to trust and who to trust, and when trust goes bad. It's about unreliable actors. Um, Angel ends up with a Jewish tinsmith who's a marvelous character, and then she abandons him. How could she? Um, but, but there was Jonah, and she was coming back together again. Jonah encounters unreliable black men as well as unreliable white men, and then there are white men who do not deny him his freedom, do not stop him on his, on his journey to freedom. And all of this reads so wonderfully accurately in terms of what we know about the historical journey. Most people did not write about their journeys, and if they did, they wrote much later, or they told their stories much later. What Robert's been able to do is to bring us along on this journey. Um, sometimes you say, oh, he's not going to do that. But indeed, he does, and he tries. And it's the attempt of the human spirit to be free. And that's all very wonderful in this. What I can tell you about Ithaca is, is I think, tremendously interesting. And you will also tell me it was, too. Um, and that is that in 1850, there were 276 African Americans in Tompkins County. Most of them were in Ithaca. Of those, 21 had been born in Virginia and 26 in Maryland, which tells you that they were born in slavery in the South. It's very likely one of them might have been free, but by and large, this whole group of people were born in slavery and made their way north. And what Robert shows in the novel is how, how much of a chance it was where you stopped and who would help you and how you would go on. And those people who stopped in Ithaca stopped here mostly by chance. There is one story, and one story only, of someone who left the Upper South and actually came to Ithaca. And he came to Ithaca because there was a man here who was tremendously important. 
in terms of the black community here. And it's a man his mother had nursed when Basil McCall, a minister in Ith a black minister in Ithaca, was a baby. And Daniel Jackson came to the north to come to Ithaca, where Basil McCall was leading the church. What this tells us is that news went not only from the south to the north, but there was news that went back to the south. And that, to me, is very interesting. One-fifth of blacks in 1850 in Tompkins County were born in the South. Fourteen of those people owned homes. Henry Moore, for example, was a barber, and his house in the census was worth $800. By 1860, there were 18 fewer black people in Ithaca than there had been in 1850. And this is significant because 1850 is the crucial date with the Fugitive Slave Act, so that people were moving on. And of the people from 1850 and 1860, only six from 1850 were still here in 1860. We had a tremendously mobile population. If you got to Ithaca in 1850, you probably, after the Fugitive Slave Act, felt that maybe you better go further on. But other people were coming up from the South. So the numbers stayed pretty much the same, but they were different people. And that, to me, is really interesting. In Rochester, there was only a gain of three among the African Americans in that census because people moved on, and, and, and it was, again, a mobile population. In Cayuga County, the numbers went down as they had in Tompkins County. Ours went down by about 18. Theirs went down about 12. Onondaga, the numbers also went down, and you had this shifting population. This is a mobile population ready to pick up at any moment. They are seeking safety for themselves, and Ithaca, which was a place of some safety, wasn't really safe enough. I think Jonah and Angel probably stayed here um, because I want them to have stayed here. Um, but I don't know. And that kind of mobility is something we don't think about very much. Um, these are people constantly looking over their shoulder because bad things are following them all the way along. I think what I like most about this book is the reality of the situations. Um, it is not a book of a hero. This is a, an ordinary traveler on the path of life, making his way as best he can, one way or another. It is an unplanned trip because they don't know, he doesn't know where he's going. Angel, his, his partner, doesn't know where she's going. And they come together finally in Ithaca with some difficulties, um, realistic difficulties. Um, but, but I think what Robert catches in this book is the historical reality of not knowing where you're going, how you're going to get there. And the only advantage Robert gives our hero is that he's literate. Um, otherwise, he's making his way, just as most of the other people who in the census are listed as illiterate, made their way, ended up here. But we have to remember this was only a short stopping place for many people. Um, it was a moving population going to a place of greatest safety they could find. Thank you. Robert Morgan is one of our nation's finest writers, a longtime resident of Ithaca, one of the most generous people I know as a friend and colleague, and the author of numerous superb books of poetry, biography, and fiction. Of his 27 books, I'd personally recommend the luminous, recently published book of lyrics, Terrier, the wonderful book on Daniel Boone, Boone, a biography, and the novels and stories that most of us relish, Gap Creek, rightly numbered among Oprah's selections, and The Road from Gap Creek, which just came out, and his numerous stories collected in the balm of Gilead Tree, selected stories. I'd also read them all. <laughs> Professor Morgan is the winner of many prizes, a Guggenheim, the Academy Award in Literature by the American Academy of Arts and Letters, 
the Thomas Wolfe Memorial Literary Award and was elected to the North Carolina Literary Hall of Fame. He is working now on a book about women in the West. He's written a prize-winning play. He's published a lovely memoir piece in the current Epic magazine. And he hopefully, with new fiction, will complete his autobiography. He's like the actress Rita Moreno, winner of an Oscar, a Tony, and a Golden Globe. There's little that Bob does not do well. And with his, wonder one, whoops, and with his wonderful wife, Nancy, all of us love him. In my usual McLean way, this is true, I wrote a nine-page pricey of Morgan's recent book, Chasing the North Star, which happily I will not make you sit through. <laughs> but if I may, I'd like to tell you a little of what I said. For those of us who are black, finding narratives that express what slavery was, how it deformed and informed black life, how people faced the most horrific vexations and lamentations, and somehow made a life bearable is a tale rarely told, and if told, is usually told badly. There are obvious exceptions. Toni Morrison's beloved, Shirley Ann Williams' Desa Rose, Ernest Gaines' The Life and Times of Miss Jane Pittman, but more often than not, the novels fail to show the true humanity of those they seek to describe. The novels often wallow too much in the savagery of slavery and what it did to the human spirit, thereby so diminishing the slave that his life appears without true resourcefulness, since he or she seemed just a congress of dissolution. And no one ultimately can relate to someone who is only a shadow of a human being. It is not possible for the reader to champion someone so lacking in human dimension, intellect, imagination, and passion. And it is not true of the experience either, since black people underwent slavery, and certainly given its horror, are enormously well adjusted. James Baldwin once quipped that given the baggage of black people's lives in America, it is, quote, a wonder that anyone can speak much less buy a can of soda, love a woman, or enjoy a sunny day. Robert Morgan's novel, Chasing the North Star, ranks with the best of these books. It is truly a work of genius because it shows the horror of slavery and the travail to gain one's freedom as confronted by smart, capacious people who were slaves, yes, but were not merely slaves that slavery did horrible things, but people were not defined by it. They, in the spiritual's language, made a way out of no way. It is also one of the most lyrical books I've ever read, one that melds superb writing with Morgan's unimpeachable ear for the telling detail and the inscrutable in human character. Wait till you encounter John Driver Goat Boy, and the tender-hearted slave mistress, Miss Williams. But what I most admire is Bob Morgan has created a, no a novel that argues for the incredible resilience and capacity of African Americans to forge a life out of their complete imaginations. They read their world. Their literacy comes in reading maps, reading nature, reading others. Those who would diminish them those who would help them, those even they might help. This is a tremendous book, full of wonderful vignettes, miraculous writing, and love for human possibility. You will never forget Angel or Jonah, and the prose that is as rich, allegorical, and trenchant as that in Toni Morrison's Sula, which at times this book reminds me of. One often wonders, given the comp lack of material benefits, given the savagery of slavery, which not only changed the body, but also hoped to enchange the mind, how a former slave could ever fashion a life. 
Bob Morgan has answered the question mightily. When Angel runs away, heading hopefully towards freedom, she muses, quote, Mistress Thomas had tried to make me learn to sew well, but I didn't want to then. But now I wanted to sew more than anything. I had to make my pretty dress. I started joining the pieces of cloth by making tiny stitches in a little bit. But the cloth was no softer or smoother than my skin. With every stitch, I was sewing my future. If clothes make the girl, I reckoned I was making myself what I would be. In this little vignette, Bob Morgan shows that it is not sewing that is the problem. It is for whom and for what one sews. In this act of self-creation, Angel has thrown off the yoke of slavery. She has, in the Bible's language, filled an old cask with new wine. A body acting in slavery is not a body acting in freedom. The operative word is choice and agency. Thank you, Bob, for this wonderful book and for exploring two equally powerful literacies. It's wonderful that we're in a library. Those of the book readers, that is, those who have been taught to read and write like Jonah, and those who lack in, quote, book smarts, brilliantly understand human psychology. Those who, like Angel, understand people's hearts, though they haven't yet learned to decipher a text. Ch Chasing the North Star is a gorgeous piece of writing. It is a true classic, classic, and it argues powerfully for you, for me, and for all of us. Sir. For years, I had wanted to write something about slavery in southern Appalachia. We have a kind of renaissance in Appalachian literature now, over the past 15 or 20 years, that very little of it has, uh, has mentioned slavery. They usually talk about the Scotch-Irish tradition, the Welsh tradition, the Germans who came there. And it's true that slavery was not practiced on the scale there that it was in the Deep South, but it certainly was there. Also, I always remember the story that my dad told me that had been told him by his grandfather, Frank Pace, about uh, the family in the 1850s after the fugitive slave law was passed. They were sitting down to supper one night, a little farmhouse uh, there in the mountains of North Carolina. They heard a noise outside, and uh, Frank Pace went to see what it was. And there were four black people asking for something to drink. Uh, they were clearly runaways from Georgia. And uh, they gave them something to eat, to uh, drink. And there, was a, there were two men, a woman, and a little boy, and the little boy had been injured. He was crippled somehow. And uh, the bounty hunters were after these people. The woman pushed the little kid to my great-great-grandmother and said, Willie can't run no more. And then they ran off. Uh, they hid this little kid in a meal bin behind the kitchen. The bounty hunters came and went on. And uh, here was this kid. They uh, expected his people to come for him at some point. They never did. They don't know if they were caught, if they didn't make it to Canada, were they killed. Uh, well, the fugitive slave law made it a crime to help runaway slaves. So my great-great-grandmother, Sarah Revis Pace, came up with an idea. <laughs> About once or twice a year, they loaded a wagon with produce, that is hams, molasses, honey, took it down to Greenville, South Carolina to peddle it door to door. So they hid Willie in the wagon, peddled their produce, 
He sat up on the wagon going back, and they said they had bought him. So he sat it. Uh, somewhat later, I don't know the exact chronology of this, she made him a blue jacket, which he's very proud of. And uh, one day they were out cutting trees on the hillside, got hot, he pulled off the blue jacket, laid it in the leaves. Uh, later they cut a tree and he saw the tree was about to fall on the jacket. And he ran and his foot slipped on the falling ground. He was killed by the tree, by the tree falling. And when I was a kid, my dad would show me the grave in the family graveyard marked by a funeral stone. That was little Willie's grave. So I always wanted to write about that. Uh, and I think that feeds into this story a little bit. Uh, it was scary to think of writing from the point of view of an escaping slave. Uh, it was scary 20 some years ago when I thought of writing from the point of view of a woman character also. Then, I decided I would just try to be like an actor and, you know, see the world from the point of view of the character. And certainly when I tried writing the story from the point of view of a woman in 1989, I discovered it was the best thing I'd ever written. Eudora Welty says, in one writer's beginning, we sometimes create our best characters by accident, but most often by going farthest from ourselves. And I think what she means by that is you have to get into the sympathetic imagination, the fictive imagination. So fiction is not on biography. <laughs> you use everything you know, but it's also acting. And it's not an accident that the greatest writer in English was an actor. Did you ever think about that? So it was scary to think of telling the story of Jonah Williams and then uh, I think it was just a tremendous stroke of good fortune when I discovered the character Angel. And I got so excited writing her sections, it alternates between third point of view, about uh, third person point of view, with Jonah and first person with Angel. I was so excited writing her sections, I could hardly wait to get up in the morning to see what she would tell me. <laughs> Angel Thomas is uh, a concubine, the bed warmer, they call it, for her owner. And she's quite a character. As she says early on, my name is Angel, but I ain't no angel. <laughs> this is her narration, her introducing herself. The first time I ever heard the word Jubilee must be when I was young and Mama went off and left me in the middle of the night. I woke up in the dark and saw Mama standing in the moonlight, coming through the window, wrapping a cloth around her head. Where are you going? I said, shh. I said, don't wake the little ones. <coughs> and Mama whispered she was going to Jubilee, but she'd be back. She said, if I didn't lie down and go to sleep again, she'd whip me with a hickory stick come morning. I lay down and closed my eyes and smelled the rose petals Mama gathered by the hedge in front of the big house. She'd crush the petals between her hands rubbed them over her neck, shoulders, and breasts. There was a murmuring outside when Mama went out the door. Then I heard footsteps and laughing and people walking away from the quarters. I lay in the dark thinking about the name Jubilee and what it meant. It must be special because Mama seemed excited, fixing herself up in the middle of the night like she was going to a revival meeting. When I opened my eyes, the moonlight was streaming down from the window, moving slowly so as not to wake my brothers and sisters I climbed off the cot and stood in the pool of light. The moonlight seemed to be calling to me. Come out and see the world now. Night is the time to play and be happy. When I opened the door and stepped outside, I saw it was true. The moonlight made the ground clean, coating everything with blue velvet and blue frost. When I opened the door and stepped outside, I held out my hands to the moon. And the moon said, look at what can be. I looked at the pine woods and the mountains beyond the woods. They were blue and silky all the way to where the stars reached down to the ridge beyond the river. I felt I could walk in that carpet of blue light all the way to the edge of heaven. This is the way things will be, the moon whispered, 
As I sat down with my back against the cabin, I must have gone to sleep sitting on the ground. For the next thing I knew, Mama was shaking me. It was dark, and the moon had gone down. What are you doing here? Mama hissed as she pushed me inside. I was so sleepy and surprised I didn't answer. I could tell Mama was hot, covered with sweat, like she'd been running or dancing the way I'd seen her do at the revival meeting. Her turban had come undone, and she had tied it around her shoulders. It smelled sweet, like rotten fruit, the way the master smelled when he'd been drinking brandy. I'll whip you in the morning, Mama said. I'll teach you to mind me. Mama got a dipper of water from the bucket in the corner and drank it, and then lay down on her cot. The worst thing about a whipping was having to wait for it. Mama knew that, and I knew that, and I guess Master Thomas knew it too, for he whipped one of the help from time to time, and he didn't mind him. But that was a bigger thing, an awful thing, to see a man whip with a black snake whip until his back was cut, and he was bleeding down to his feet. Mama might say as a warning, I'm going to cut the blood out of you, but she never did. She knew the worst part of punishment was the anticipation. The next morning, after we ate mush with molasses, and I washed up the bowls, Mama said, you know what I need? Go get me that hickory. It was a relief to finally go and get it over with. Better be a good switch or I'll whip you twice, Mama said. Sad as it was to have to go after my own switch, there was a kind of dignity to it. All I had to do was get the hickory and bear the whipping and cry a little to make Mama feel I was sorry, and then it would be all right again. <laughs> I couldn't stand for Mama to be mad at me. If Mama was mad at me, then the whole world seemed twisted and empty. After I brought her the switch, Mama made me go outside. I had to stand in the yard where everybody could see the whipping. She made me hold her left hand with my left hand as she whipped me on my legs and on my butt. The hickory stung my skin like hot wire. How many times I have to tell you to mind me, Mama said, as she swung the switch. I do mind you, I said. Don't you sass me, Mama said, and swung harder. I mind you, I mind you, I said, starting to cry. You sass me and cut the blood out of you, Mama said. She was so busy whipping me, and my eyes were so full of tears, neither of us saw the master standing nearby watching. His sleeves were rolled up like he was on the way to the field. When the crops needed tending, the master sometimes worked right along beside and down the hill. Don't whip that girl. She didn't mean to do nothing wrong, Master Thomas said. Mama stepped back and dropped the hickory to her side. Angel's too pretty to whip, Master Thomas said. Her skin's too perfect, her face too pretty. What has she done? She don't mind me, Mama said. She sassed me. The master put his hand on my shoulder and looked into my eyes. I shivered at his touch, yet I was pleased by it. At the same time, I could feel the power in his hand, which is not the power of muscles and calluses. Angel don't mean to be bad, Master Thomas said. Besides, she's a <coughs> young woman. He looked me in the eyes and smiled, and I tried to smile back through my tears. Would you like to work in the big house? The master said, I think you're grown up enough to work in the big house. Would you like that? I nodded, forgetting the sting on my legs. That was how I came to live in the master's house before I was grown up. Mama didn't say anything. She washed me up and had me put on my clean dress. Other women in the quarters gave me looks. And Jesse May, who was a little older than me, said, if master wants to fiddle with you, you better let him. But I didn't answer her. So that's how she became the mistress of the owner. Now the first version of Angel's narration was written in dialect. This is somebody who can't read or write. And I worked really hard on that. My editor worked hard on it. My editor retired in 2013, so a new editor came on, uh, a very good one, named Chuck Adams, and he thought that dialect would alienate contemporary readers. It'd be hard to read. And I, just, I thought about it over a weekend and decided he was probably right, because I want the reader to feel very close to this narrator. So I decided that Angel's telling this years later, after she has learned <laughs> to read and write, and I rewrote the whole thing in this very plain, grammatical English. 
And I think that was right. It's almost, I hope it's transparent that you're with her. And, and you know, the danger of using dialect, especially heavy dialect, is you make the reader, uh, uh, you know, have to puzzle over it sometimes, but also not feel that intimacy, which is, is very important. Uh, well, the story is they're going, they're trying to go up north, they don't know exactly where they're going. He has an idea, he's seen maps, but he also, she joins him. She's, she realizes that Jubilee that he's a runaway, he has these stripes on his back for one thing, and, uh, and he says, oh, I fell into a fence, and she said, yeah, that fence following you. <laughs> uh, she realizes that if he can do it, if he has the gumption to run away, maybe she can too, she's gonna follow him. Besides, he's literate, and, and he does seem to have this map in his head. And she follows, and he tries to get away from her because he thinks he doesn't have as good a chance if there's somebody with him. She's determined to follow him. So that's basically the plot of the novel. He runs away from her four times. But the first time he runs away, she runs into the goat man, <laughs> who's a tinker. This is based on a real character who went up and down the south with goats and a little wagon, sharpening tools and fixing pots and pans for people. And uh, he reads from a book with, uh, with uh, figures. Uh, she, she knows they're not English, she, she, but she doesn't know exactly what they are. Uh, and I leave it up to the reader. What is he? Is he a Turk? Is he, is he Jewish? Uh, see, we, we never find out for sure exactly uh, what he is. But they going up into the valley of Virginia, approaching Roanoke, originally called Big Lick, uh, Virginia. One of the reasons I wanted to write this story was I wanted to write some fiction set in Ithaca, New York, where I have lived for the past uh, 45 years. <laughs> so almost all my fiction has been set in southern Appalachia. I tell people down there I moved to northern Appalachia. Uh, <laughs> We don't think of Ithaca that way, but it sort of is, really. <laughs> they make it to Owego, and they're thinking of going to Auburn. They've been told that's a place you go, underground railroad. And uh, they find out there's this train in Owego that goes to Ithaca. They unload cargo from boats on the Susquehanna <laughs> onto the train over to Lake Cuga. And of course, there, they're in contact, in communication with the Erie Canal. So I think it was a very important place uh, for commerce. He jumps on the train. She decides uh, she's too tired. She can't run and jump on the train. And he leaves her again. Rides the train, almost freezing to death, across the hills to this town by a lake, where you can see the waterfalls and the lake drops off the train. At the corner of Aurora Street, John and I came to a brick church with stained glass windows and found the door unlocked. It was mostly dark inside, but he saw benches and the light from the colored windows. Out of the wind, the air was warmer. As Jonah's eyes adjusted a little, he saw a stove at the side of the church near the altar. He walked toward the front and realized as he neared it that a fire was crackling in the stove. But the stove was lit. Somebody must be in the church. Hello and welcome, a voice said. Jonah spun around and saw a man in a shiny black robe emerge from the room behind the pulpit. Hello, sir, Jonah said and took off his hat. I just wanted to get warm. I'm Timothy Ballou, the man on the road said. You're most welcome. Jonah was so surprised, he couldn't think what to say. He couldn't claim to be a laborer on his way to work. It must be a Sunday if a fire was roaring in the stove. And he's been carrying a scythe with him through Pennsylvania. So it looks like he's going to a job. <laughs> this is one of his ruses. He's always thinking of schemes to make himself look like anything but a runaway. Make yourself at home, Reverend Ballou said. He was a short man with glasses and side whiskers. He didn't seem at all surprised to see Jonah. We'll have a worship service in about 20 minutes, the Reverend said. You're very welcome to stay. Thank you, sir. 
Jonah said. The minister looked at Jonah's boots and his coat soiled with soot and ashes from the train. I keep coffee and biscuits in the back room to refresh me while I prepare my sermons. He said, could I offer you something to nibble? Jonah knew it was impolite to accept, but he was too famished to refuse. Thank you, sir, he said, and bowed his head. Reverend Ballou led him to the little room piled with books and papers. Another black robe hung from a hook in the corner. A coffee pot sat on the hearth of a small fireplace where lazy flames beckoned and gestured. The preacher cleared a spot at the table and set a plate of biscuits and a cup of coffee before Jonah. As Jonah sipped the coffee, he felt the hot liquid warm his belly and began to spread through him. His bones ached with cold, and the warm coffee didn't touch the marrow at first. The biscuits were sweet as the sweetest cake. And Mrs. Ballou, who was the organist, arrived and also invited Jonah to stay for the service. She was taller than her husband, with dark hair, pale skin, and blue eyes. She invited Jonah to come to their house for dinner after the meeting. I hope you'll find friends in Ithaca, she said. As he watched the church fill, Jonah wondered how safe he was here, appearing in public at a service for everybody to see. There was no guarantee that Reverend Ballou, kind as he seemed, wouldn't report him for the sheriff if he knew Jonah was a runaway. And someone in the congregation might be suspicious of him and inform the authorities. But as he warmed up, filled with coffee and biscuits and butter, Jonah felt heavier and heavier. He had walked many miles, and he had not slept much the night before. As soon as the Reverend Ballou stood up and announced the first hymn, and the congregation began to sing, Jonah was already asleep. He dreamed about cliffs and waterfalls and sparkling lakes. It was only after the church was empty that Reverend Ballou woke him. Service is over, the preacher said and shook his shoulder. I can see how rousing my sermon was. <laughs> the preacher laughed and Jonah woke to his laughter. I'm sorry, sir, Jonah mumbled. No need to apologize, the minister said. Perhaps you needed sleep more than a sermon. Jonah had slept so deeply in the warm church, he was befuddled. It took him a minute to understand Reverend Ballou's questions. Uh, yes, sir, Joan murmured, as if he was about to go back to sleep. Well, I have just one question, really, uh, Reverend Ballou, Ballou said. Uh, have you killed anybody? Jonah woke and looked uh, the preacher in the eye. No, sir, he said, I never killed anybody. Well, that settles it, the preacher said. Uh, come with me to the house, and we'll have some dinner. And it turns out to Reverend Ballou is an abolitionist, and he has a printing press in his basement, and he prints a credible document of manumission. And as Carol said, this is no absolute guarantee of safety. But this is a lot better than what he has been encountering before. I'll stop there. Thank you very much.